I've wanted to do something like this for a long time. Introduce our speaker. <laughs> I've got a lot of dirt on <laughs> John Munson has done as much or more for Audubon as anyone uh, that I have known in my 25 years with the organization. He was president four years, right? <laughs> you talked me into another term. <laughs> Yeah, I, I do have that tendency. <laughs> uh, he and his wife, Barb, were membership chairs, I think, in the neighborhood of six years, something like that. And that is uh, a lot of responsibility. Um, about three weeks from today, we'll be closing our bluebird boxes for the uh, season. And John was right there when we started. We didn't have any money to buy boxes. And so uh, what we did was, John had the idea, have people sponsor them. And so we had people pay $10, 15 $20 uh, for sponsorships for a period of at least four or five years. Uh, there John was with a, an innovative idea. We also had a book, Jewels of Nature, that uh, uh, Alan Haney wrote. Alan is in the audience. And uh, John was, and Larry, um, uh, were very responsible for the sales of that book. And we ended up uh, selling essentially all of them. And John is currently the VP. Uh, we demoted him. So. <laughs> but he'll be back, I think. John also has another life. Audubon life is one thing, you've just heard about that. But he has a life of travel. I've already been with him, my wife and I, to the Grand Canyon. And I don't know how many trips he's taken down the Grand Canyon. And Costa Rica. Okay. John just got back from two places. Ghana, where he has a, a religious uh, pledge to help the citizens of that country. Um, he also has taken walking and biking trips to Europe. And um, recently, so I spent time for about a year, uh, over a year's period, uh, actually only two or three weeks in the country, Kenya, most recently, and what he'll be talking about tonight, is his experience with South Africa and the Kruger National Park, birds and mammals, is his uh, goal to talk to you tonight. So, with nothing else to say, John, it's all yours. <laughs> Can we get the lights down a little bit, please? And then we'll get started. See what we can do. Uh, I spent a lot of years in uh, Division I coaching, so I have a fairly loud voice. But if I'm not loud enough in the back, let me know. I'll tune it up a little. So, uh, we're going to begin tonight. Uh, I thought you might like to see this one of the endangered species. It's a ground hornbill. It's a turkey-sized bird. And uh, I was fortunate enough to see about 10 or 12 of these so far in my trips there. Uh, over the last three years, I've been doing trips to South Africa. And some of the people in the audience have been along. Uh, I have to give Jan Seiler some notes because Jan and I concentrated on trying to take bird pictures this last August. And uh, Bruce Miller over here. Bruce and I concentrated a lot of big, big animals. And so I don't take credit for all the pictures that you'll see. I'm a point-and-shoot photographer. <laughs> if it says auto, it's good enough for me. Uh, Bruce, on the other hand, he's a more professional, but uh, Jan takes wonderful pictures. So let's, let's, uh, let's get started, and uh, we'll see where we go. So we're going to talk about birds and mammals at Kruger National Park, and I tried to select a variety of animals and a variety of birds out of the hundreds and hundreds that we have. So we'll look at this. 
<coughs> this is the chief of the Shangata tribe. Uh, the chief, he only has three wives now. He used to have six. But he's down to three. He says, I'm getting a little bit old. He says, maybe I'll add one more. Uh, quite an interesting fellow to talk with that we visit him each time we go. So tonight we're going to talk about uh, the adventure to South Africa, introduce Kruger National Park, uh, review a few of the issues that faces the park. Now we don't have enough time to talk about all of them. And then we're going to scare a lot of birds and mammal pictures. So this is going to be a pictorial night. <clears throat> so let's begin. Our journey begins by leaving Chicago O'Hare, flying to Atlanta, from Atlanta to Johannesburg. And once we get to Johannesburg, we then go about an hour and a half north to Kolobi Safari. I have two good friends, they're native South Africans, they own a big game ranch, they raise breeding stock for large game animals. So it's an interesting place, and you get up in the morning, uh, if you're up early, you get to see a sunset, and this is your kind of housing uh, at Kolobi. Or they say Kolobi. It uh, literally transferred to the warthog. <laughs> uh, housing inside, uh, nice little rooms. Uh, this is a luxury trip, people, if you want to go on a trip like this. These are, these are very nice places. But uh, let's go back to the park. The National Park was named after President Paul Kruger, but you need to go back in history a little bit. When you go back in South African history, you can see a tremendous English and Dutch influence. A uh, variety of wars, mostly fighting the tribes that lived in South Africa at the time. Basically the Dutch and English came in, captured them. The slave trade, of course, was very hot and heavy along the coast. Uh, and the major tribes would capture the weaker tribes, sell them to the slavers. The slavers then would sell them all over the world. They didn't all come to the U.S. They went everywhere. But uh, Kruger National Park was originally conceived as a hunting preserve for the wealthy. That they set aside this large area that they could preserve game animals because everybody was shooting them all over South Africa. South Africa has a very strong hunting ethic that started very, very early and is still part of their culture today. So when you go there, it's not like going to other places. Now, Kruger National Park is a very large park, 20,000 square kilometers, <coughs> size of many smaller countries. One of the few places you can still see large uh, herds of big game animals, and in their natural state, but it is a closed ecosystem. It is like Yellowstone. All the way around it are electric fences, are great big game ranches. And so uh, the animals that live there don't have the luxury of traveling all through <coughs> South Africa. They are in this ecosystem, and that's where the native South Africans go to commune with nature, that there's a problem. It's gotten so expensive because ecotourism from around the world, thousands and thousands of people visiting the national park. Each year, the government said, well, look, we got all these people coming, let's just raise the rates each day. Let's raise them this year, and next year, and next year, and next year. And pretty soon, the average South African cannot afford to go to Kruger National Park for a day trip. This is happening in our country. You don't have to go very far to see rates for county parks, state parks, national parks mm -hmm. being raised, raised, raised. Pretty soon, we'll have the same problem they have. We're going to look at the low veld, which means low-lying grasslands. And it's a lot of scrubby brush, a uh, few good-sized trees, mostly in the Acacia and Mopani families. Uh, we'll see some of those. And it has rivers, a variety of rivers. They all flow east, they go through Mozambique, and they end up in the, in the ocean. So we'll see some of those. It overlies the granite. Uh, it's weathered over millions and millions of years, and it's a very thin layer of soil. Now, it doesn't mean it's flat. So uh, it's, it's flat and rolling grassy plains. And so when you see grassy plains, low veld, 
you'll see a lot of this gray. This is winter time that we were there. And a lot of pictures tonight are winter time in South Africa. Uh, blue <coughs> wildebeest, we'll see them after a while. But then <coughs> the southern part and the area closer to Mozambique, lots of rolling hills, they actually have a few low mountain ranges. So it's uh, a, a very pretty place to visit. It's wide open and it's an interesting time to go. Uh, one morning we were sitting on our balcony in the, in the National Park and we're looking out, uh, we're eating our breakfast and we're watching these elephants come up to get water. Large herds of elephants. And we'll talk a lot about elephants in, in a bit. Of course, when you have river systems, you have critters. <clears throat> and uh, crocodiles are their main big predator in the river. And so you see all sizes of them. This happens to be a good sized one. And then you see birds. These are water thick knees living dangerously. <laughs> uh, the thick knees are almost always in pairs, or are very much around water, uh, but in pairs, and they know exactly where they are. How many see three crocodiles in that picture? Two, three? Uh, there's a little bit of a tail up in the right hand left hand corner here. So there are three in that picture. And of course, uh, crocodiles travel across land. They don't just stay in the river. They go from pond to pond, <coughs> low area to low area. And uh, we stayed at a place called the Treehouse and it had a little swimming pool. And I uh, saw the sign. I said, I don't think I'm going swimming tonight. I think I'll pass it up for today. But it's a very interesting place to stay. Well, everybody wants to go to South Africa. They want to see the big predators. So how many are there? About a thousand leopards, 120 cheetah, 20,000 uh, square kilometers, uh, 1,750 lions, 5,300 spotted hyenas, and a few wild dogs. And they do have some other jackals, but they're not considered predators. They, they're scavengers more. They do catch small game, <coughs> but the big game people we're looking at. And so we'll start with the leopard. The leopard. This leopard was uh, up in a tree, right beside the road as we drove through Kruger. Uh, he had an impala pulled up in, into the tree because if he doesn't pull his prey up, the lions will get it. You have to put them fairly high in the tree. Now, of course, when you see a leopard and you're in the vehicle, pretty soon you've got a whole bunch of vehicles trying to horn in <laughs> and get close. Uh, leopard finally had enough of that, got down out of the tree and gave me a nice shot. <laughs> so, uh, so it's a, a beautiful leopard. The cheetahs, uh, only 120 of them, uh, mainly because they like open, wide open vistas. They don't mind getting up on top of the termite mounds so they can get a better view, but with all this scrubby brush, uh, they're vulnerable to other predators and particularly lions. So there aren't very many cheetahs in Kruger National Park. <coughs> if you're really lucky, you can find one. And on my first trip, I happened to find one. And so that was a, a good, good sighting. Lions, uh, they think there's probably closer to 2,000 lions now, uh, mainly due to the population of Cape Buffalo and Impala is growing. And so uh, this is a, a male lion up close and personal. And uh, they're very, very powerful beasts. Their primary prey is the Cape Buffalo. Cape Buffalo weigh almost a ton, 1,800 pounds or someplace in there. Uh, to be able to take down one of those beasts uh, takes a very powerful animal. The females uh, are a little bit smaller than the males. Uh, they do a lot of the hunting, and they take care of the pride of the cubs. And so you will see them, they blend into the grass quite well. And so that's uh, fun to see them and spot them. And you'll see them walking around down the rivers, uh, in, laying out on the beach, in a sense, getting sun. And uh, so we, we do get to see quite a few lions when we go. Of course, cubs are always of interest. And I like this one because it's just like people. 
there's always somebody going the wrong direction. <laughs> Every time. Uh, somebody's going the wrong direction. Uh, but Cubs, anywhere from three to five is a typical uh, number when they're born. And only about half of them survive. Uh, partly they get uh, predators uh, catch them and kill them. The hyenas will kill them. The leopards will kill them. Uh, other male lions will kill the cubs. And so uh, you will see some cubs occasionally. This is the spotted hyena, the female. Uh, she looks like she's pregnant, but she's not. Uh, they are tremendous predators, very powerful jaws. One of the only animals that can catch another uh, critter. They'll take down an impala, or take down a niyala, or take down a kudu, or something like that, and they'll eat every piece of it. They'll have powerful enough jaws to break the bones and swallow the bones and the feet and everything else. So uh, they have a tremendous digestive system, but they eat, fill up, and then they go back to feed the cubs, uh, and they regurgitate food. Uh, the cubs can have something to eat. These are cubs that are about uh, three months old. Uh, a lot of times we'll see them in the culverts that go underneath the road. And what you look for is a bunch of little small scattered bones outside the culvert. Where she bought the females, brought some things back for them to eat. And you'll, you'll notice just outside of the culvert a few little bones. So if you look carefully, you can, you can spot them. We'll begin looking at larger mammals. I thought you might like to see a few kudus. Uh, the male over on the side is the horns. They're spiral shaped. There's the one in the middle is kind of a, a younger one. We'll get closer. And then the females over on the left side. Uh, elk size animals. Burchell zebras. Uh, in South Africa, the ranchers have given up pretty much on raising beef. They, it takes too much water, too much hay, even raise a little corn to feed them. And so the game animals have been there forever. And so now most of the big game ranchers are raising zebras and blue wildebeest. If you go to the stores in any African village, you go to the meat market, you get venison. Venison could be impala, it could be kudu, it could be zebra, it could be uh, whatever. <coughs> and so, uh, very good meat, nothing wrong with it at all. It's just raised in a natural setting on these huge big game ranches. This one posed for me, one of my favorite pictures. And uh, you get a chance to see it. Now this is an orange zebra. Uh, my outfitter's wife was a city slicker. And the first time he had a date with her, she came out to his ranch. He took her out to see the zebras. And she came back all excited that she'd seen an orange zebra. And her mother and father just started laughing and laughing and laughing. All this was, they have red clay. The zebras, like anything else, they like to roll in the dust, and they get an orange cast to them. But she was convinced it's an orange zebra. It's just one that's a little bit dusty. There's a close-up of a male kudu. Uh, this is a big game animal that many hunters like to go to South Africa to hunt. Very strong hunting ethic throughout South Africa. It's big business. Uh, huge, big game <coughs> ranchers. Two, three, four hundred thousand acres, and they hunt the various game animals and they manage those game animals on their game ranches. This is the female. I know she doesn't have the horns. Uh, very pretty animals. Uh, they're not real large, uh, probably 1,200 pounds, and, uh, but very, very sleek looking. The king buffalo, uh, red-billed oxpeckers, the birds that are sitting on the back, uh, you see them on the uh, rhinos, you see them on the elephants, you see them on the giraffes, 
they're looking for ticks and mites and any other little critter that's in the burrowing in the fur, they also act as a warning system. If something's coming close, the birds will spot it, fly up, and the they Cape Buffalo will go on alert. And so this is this is a very fairly good sized male. And it, then this particular picture, if you notice the one down in the, as you look at it to your left, lying down, that's the herd bull. The herd bull has a very gnarly forehead that's called the boss. And uh, they get that curly, massive look when they get to four, five, six years old. If you look directly behind the girl, there's a female, she has hair. No boss, hair at the top, easy to determine a female. If you look over on your right hand side, you'll see two younger bulls, and you can tell they are because they have a deep crease down the middle of the boss, and it's smooth. So these are only a couple years old. Uh, this is an animal that you don't want to walk up to and try to pet. They're extremely dangerous. Uh, they don't see real well, but they have exceptional hearing. And they have exceptional smell ability. So uh, when you're in the area, as long as you're in the vehicle, you're safe. If you were to get out in the middle, yeah, they would charge. Uh, so Cape Buffalo is the main source of lion food. This is their preferred food. So imagine a lion being powerful enough to take down one of these very, very large animal. This shows the pecking order. The one in front is the herd bull. If you look at the boss, each one of them is a little bit less gnarly. And they know their place in the herd. The boss, uh, the herd bull, controls the others, usually found in the middle of the herd. And they're smart enough to go, if something's going to attack, I'm going to be in the middle. They can have the other ones on the outside. Uh, but we will see quite a number of those. We see Elon and Gebsbuck, uh, more open plains, more open grass areas. Uh, again, uh, elk size. The uh, oryx, the Gebsbuck, on the about half the size, about 800 pounds. And uh, we, uh, we, we did a stop on the way back to the airport at a little private game farm that had a, also a restaurant. And they had a whole bunch of animals in a big pen right out behind. Actually, it's a huge, big area. But they are all close because that's where the water and the food was. And so we got a chance to take a few pictures. <clears throat> Blue wildebeest that are herd animal. Uh, one of the most common animals that we see. Uh, typical herd anywhere from 15 to 45 or 50. Uh, sometimes it gets bigger than that when they're migrating some. <coughs> but they're, uh, uh, this is the cattle of South Africa. It's the one that they have in the markets mostly. One up the close. And that one shows the blueness of the, of the wildebeest. Uh, they're not particularly aggressive. They would rather flee. Uh, but you can get fairly close to them and get some good pictures. This is another, there are about 20 different kinds of antelope from all sizes. So I'm kind of going from the larger ones down to the smaller ones. Uh, this is Niala. And the yawa, uh, again, not a large animal, eight, nine hundred pounds. Uh, grassland animal. Uh, from the, the native South Africans told me this is the best tasting one of all. So, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, elephants. Everybody wants to see elephants. This one's name is Axe. Uh, we went to Lataba. It uh, has an elephant museum. It's one of the compounds. In, uh, National Park, and it had an elephant museum, and it had the top ten living elephants, the largest living elephants in South Africa, 
And my, my wife and I are reading them. And it said Acts. And down below it says lives in this area. So in the morning we got up. We got in our vehicles. We were about three or four miles out, outside. Uh, going down the road. And here's Acts standing there. We could tell because he had one tusk that's very long and straight. And the other tusk that turned up. Each one of these tusks weighs about 120 pounds. <coughs> A very large old elephant, about 65 years old. Uh, they know that they live up into their 70s, but they don't know for sure how, what the oldest elephant is. But Axe is an older elephant. The largest elephant I've seen on my trip is called Tatters. And he's called Tatters because all of notches in his ears from fighting. <laughs> this is a very large bull elephant. It's about 30 <coughs> years old. He's massive. And uh, when you see these animals up close, uh, up close means we're about from where I am to the back of the room. It's about how far we were away. Axe, on the other hand, I had to get my small pocket camera out and take pictures of him because he was about from here to that wall <laughs> away. And so uh, you will get close to elephants if you go to South Africa. And uh, you'll see the cows, and you'll see the little ones uh, quite frequently. A typical herd might have anywhere from 15 to 50 in a, in a herd of elephants. Uh, they cover a lot of ground during the day. And of course, then this is a younger one. Now, Kruger has a problem. And I want to illustrate that by saying, okay, everybody on this side of the room, you are elephant hunters, and you're going to shoot elephants. Everybody on that side of the room, you don't like shooting elephants, and uh, it's against your beliefs. Well, here's the problem in Kruger. Kruger National Park will support in their habitat an environment about 9,000 elephants. That's what the habitat will support. The problem, they have over 22,000 elephants. Mm -hmm. Now, 22,000 elephants cause a lot of damage. They walk up to an acacia tree, they put their forehead against it, they bulldoze it down, they eat the tops. The giraffes now are looking for things that are up munch up there because they got long necks, they feed at the tops of the trees. The elephant just knocked over the tree and so a giraffe has a problem. The South African government says, well, what are we going to do? Uh, a lot of people don't want to hunt elephants. So we got to whittle down this, this population somehow to 9,000. If you ask any game manager at Kruger National Park, they will say, we have 9,600 elephants. <laughs> because that's what the National Park, to get that designation of National, International National Park, you have to have that no more than that amount of elephants. I got a chance to talk to a couple elephant experts that are in Kruger. And I said, you know, I, I was here two years ago, and it looks to me like everything's being bulldozed down. He said, you're pretty observant. I said, I said, I bet you got 18,000 elephants. He said, well, you're close. It's a little short. And then he told me they got about 22,000. So in order to call these elephants and reduce that herd size, you only have two choices. You can shoot them because you can't pick up a whole herd of 50 elephants and move them someplace else. The cows, the matriarchs, the cow, the herd, knows where the best food is, knows where the water is, knows the little migration routes, knows where the rivers are. They know the whole area. So if you took them and put them in Mozambique, the next country over, they'd go, oh, food, instant food. Thank you very much. We won't have any. You take them and you go north, you put them in another country, now you have poachers who are poaching ivory. So the South African government has decided to empty many of the ponds, empty uh, many of their, their watering holes, and they're going to starve these elephants, and they're going to force them into one area along the river system. Now guess what? All the other animals are going to follow them. And so now we've got this bigger problem. So this is not an easy thing to solve. And uh, people would say, well, why don't we call some of them? 
Uh, let's, let's allow hunters to go in. We'll charge them a huge fee, $70,000, $80,000. We'll take their money, we'll put it back in the national park, and we'll use their money. The anti-hunting group will say, oh, you can't do that. Okay, okay, we'll starve them to death. Uh, when, the, when they starve, uh, rather than having 9,000, the population eventually just crashes and goes down to a very low number. So this is a, it's a very serious problem. How many uh, vertebrae does the giraffe have? Same as we do, seven. That's cervical vertebra, seven. You know the other animals that have more than seven? The manatee has nine, and the two-souled sloth has eight. I could get those backwards, I'll have to look it up again. <laughs> but uh, you do see giraffes, and we, they're very beautiful creatures. We got so close one time I had to lean out the window and look up in order to see one of them to get a, get a look at them. Uh, up close, very close, uh, beautiful animals, and uh, they're very graceful. They can move, they can kick. Tremendous power in their legs. That's how they defend themselves. Probably saw a thousand giraffes, lots and lots of giraffes. They're all over the place. The sable antelope, uh, my good friends, South African friends, raise sable. This is their specialty. They raise sable breeding stock. And then they take their breeding bull, their best breeding stock, and they sell it to another big game farm who needs to breed more sable. And so uh, this happens to be on Daniel's place. We actually got to dart one of these, had the vet come out. We darted it, we got to go up and pet it. And then they put the antidote back in and then about 30 seconds later it's up on its feet and gone. Uh, quite beautiful animals. These are the younger ones. These are about a year and a half old. And this is the full mature bull. Uh, 48 inch curl horns worth about $100,000 as a breeding stock bull. So Daniel raises these uh, as one of his special on uh, his game farm. Now the impala is not endangered at all. If we saw 1,000, we saw 10,000. <laughs> this is the McDonald's of the grassy plains. If you look on their butt, big M. <laughs> All the other predators go beat. <laughs> and so it's one of the ones that are very large, they're herd animals, and are very plentiful, uh, very pretty. They live in these larger herds like this, not unusual to see 50, 100 in a big herd. And so you see them all over. Warthog. Yeah, warthog. <laughs> we'll see another one up close a little bit. Uh, another male, they come in different colors. This is a white face. This is not an albino. Doesn't have pink eyes, uh, but it's just a white face <coughs> in power. And they come in dark colors, lighter browns, and sometimes more white like this. <coughs> this is the water buck. These are all antelopes. The male, uh, quite beautiful animals, a long stiletto horn. And this is the female. And I say, you know, you can always tell them because they have the big white bull, bullseye on the back side. Uh, very distinctive markings. Uh, very beautiful animal. And then the warthog. This is the male warthog. He has two warts. He has one down towards the snout. And there's one underneath his eye. The females only have one. So you're easy to look at them. Uh, the big tusk looking things really are teeth. They're not tusks, they're turned teeth. And uh, they're razor sharp, they trap them with rubbing against each other. And they're like our, our hogs. Uh, this one up close is a young one. And uh, I actually got a chance to pet this one. I want to see what it felt like. Uh, it was in an enclosure, it was sleeping. So, I quick reached over, <laughs> just like one of our hogs, bristly, 
softer skin underneath. Uh, fun to get a chance to be up that, that close to one. Uh, the rhino. Uh, poaching is still a problem in South Africa. You go, know, the horn is made of keratin. It's like our fingernails. Uh, it grows constantly. The older they get, the longer it gets. This is a quite old one. Uh, it's a white rhino. The white rhino has a very flat, square mouth. They are grazers. Uh, they graze on the grass and uh, different from the black rhino. The black rhino, they say, is extinct in South Africa. That's what they'll tell you. Uh, these are red bill oxpeckers on the back of a, of a rhino. This is a typical dung heap uh, all along the road. The white rhinos come out along the road because they graze at night. They like to, and the road makes nice, easy walking at night. Now in Kruger, if you are on the road at night with a vehicle, they assume that you are a poacher. So very likely you're going to get shot at. So you don't go out at Kruger and go out at night and go to the compound. You're inside the compound by 6 o'clock when it gets dark. And then you come back out. But the white rhinos will come on along the road and they'll use their latrine and they have these great big things, they're 10 feet around. Now, a black rhino is, a, is not, not a grazer. It's a browser, much like our deer. It goes along and snips a few leaves here, a little brush here, a little bit here. It's got more of a pointed snoot and big lips. And they're very selective about what they eat. They haven't, quote, seen black rhinos in Kruger. However, they don't like each other. Black rhinos don't like white rhinos. So they come to a dung heap, and they walk across it, and as they go across, they drag their back feet and spray feces all over. <laughs> and let the white rhino know, I'm around. So if you see one of these, you know there's some place there's a black rhino in the area. <coughs> Even though they say they're extinct, there are very few numbers. The horn problem. Uh, the typical horn is worth about $100,000 to a, a person who poaches it on the black market. And they sell it and the price goes up, 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 up. Supposedly some kind of aphrodisiac sold in China a lot, uh, make it into a powder. Uh, you can't blame someone who is starving and living a subsistence living that says, look, I can go over there and poach a rhino horn and make as much money on a single horn as I can make in 25 years of working. Think about the, the, the problem that's underlying some of this poaching that we have. We have the China problem where they are buying and paying extraordinary high salaries for these, uh, you know, money for these. And then you've got the locals who some of them are very, very poor, destitute, that says this is the way for me to get out of my culture, make some good money, and I can live a nice, peaceful life. So, South Africa now allows the ranchers to grow rhinos. And they allow them to sell those horns on the open market. While we were there, uh, the ranch about 10 miles down the road uh, had some uh, mob type people come demanding rhino horns from the owner of the rhino farm. Uh, he had them in the bank, not at the ranch. They demanded, 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 and of course they didn't give it to them, so they shot both the husband and wife. So rhino is a problem, and poaching is a problem in South Africa. Uh, has lots of underlying reasons. Uh, I asked, what happens, what do you do with poachers? Uh, when you catch poachers out in the bush, the guy said, there's a lot of bones out there. <laughs> They're being very serious. <coughs> Uh, they pretty much just shoot the poachers and they're done with them. 
Hippo is the most dangerous animal. Uh, that's the female. She's only got a couple years. She saw that in years. And this is the male. We went to a little pond impoundment. There was a, two females and a male. This male, way in the back, five, six hundred yards away. When we pulled up, he put his head up in the air and he bellowed and said, let us know he's down there. Well, then he started coming closer. He got about 200 yards away. He sprayed water everywhere and he bellowed and he shook like, like bad. And he said, hey, this is my place. Then he got about 30 yards away from me and he opened his mouth and you know, he didn't smell very good. <laughs> he was that close. And he let us know that you, it's time for you to move. Uh, most dangerous animal, they actually will tip uh, canoes over, uh, small boats. The biggest issue is natives use the walking paths. They go up out of the rivers at night and they walk up into the grassy areas to graze. And uh, the natives are up there too walking in from place <coughs> to place on these paths. A hippo can outrun a human a short distance. Uh, extremely one bite, you're done. This is a, a group of hippos is called a pod. So you got a bunch of hippos, that's a pod of hippos. You can tell their ages by the amount of pink they have on them. You, know, you thought the pink and the dancing hippos in the movies, well that's true. They lose their pigmentation around their eyes and their ears as they get older. But the younger ones are much darker color. The older ones get more pinkish. And so we do see lots of hippos. Let's take a look at a few more grassland. I thought this was good. No hunting allowed at Kruger National Park whatsoever. And so you see a kudu sign and what do you see? A bullet hole right in the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Wisconsin. This is Tessabe, the fastest antelope. Uh, Looks like it put together about six different parts. Uh, they really can fly. They are very fast at animal. A herd animal, uh, medium size, 13, 14, 1500 pounds, a good size. There you go. This is the red heart of these. You can tell those back turn horns on top. Uh, again, medium size, herd animal. Uh, you can get fairly close to these. This is a better picture of that meow than the one I had earlier. Uh, very nice looking, uh, very sleek looking animal. And this is of course the impala. And an impala male with its harem. Uh, and you'll see uh, a group of them and it might be uh, four or five males but they have 10 or 15 females around them and they keep track of them all the time. They are trying to steal, steal one from the one next door. <laughs> this is a blessed buck. They have a nice blaze white face. Uh, another one of the very nice antelopes. And uh, they like more open where it's grassy and, and more open uh, terrain. And you know, we'll see that. Okay, how many cook springers do you see? There's two of them. One up on top and the right. One down, lying down at the bottom. Or the left. They are goat size. Uh, and they jump around these rocks just like a goat. Like a mountain goat. They move through the rocks. They prefer this rocky terrain. And they can jump around and disappear in a hurry. Uh, they're fun to see. They're small, small animals. The gray diker, this is the one standing up, this is the one lying down. Uh, 30, 35 pounds, relatively small, uh, full grown. That's as big as they get, not very big at all. And then this is the one that uh, my outfitter says he's seen four of these in all the times he's been in Kruger. And he's been there hundreds of times. This is a sharp grease box. It's a female said she came out along the road in order to have her young. She's going to have a calf. They weigh about 22 pounds. They're very small. 
they feel safe out along the road with their vehicle where it keeps the other predators further away. And so we, we did get a chance at beautiful ears, beautiful markings on their ears. The monkeys, uh, the Brevet monkey, uh, pretty much all over South Africa. You see lots of them on the roadside, you see them at Kruger. Uh, they're great thieves. If you stop at one of the compounds and you get your lunch and you go out, you put it on your table and you walk over here to get something to drink, the monkey comes down out of the tree quick, grab your plate and go off. Uh, very good at it and very quick. Nice little monkey. <coughs> Baboons are very uh, uh, powerful creatures. Uh, they're good size. Uh, they uh, pretty much eat anything they get. They, they eat uh, buds, they eat fruit, they, uh, eat, they, they dig in the soil to get roots of various plants. And so uh, they're foragers. And they're a lot of times in fairly good sized troops. So you'll see them by the, and the grooming behavior is quite prevalent. There's a bunch of them that are in a water hole. And I don't know what's on the other side. There's a giraffe in the background up there. Uh, more baboons out foraging in the morning. Well, let's take a look at birds now. I'm going to try to keep moving here so that uh, you don't take too long. Uh, there are about a thousand birds, but only about 560 of them are indigenous to South Africa. They are common, they stay there. So we see a lot of birds that have a lot of migration coming through. So we'll take a look at these. And I thought you might like this. I get up in the morning, it's a very misty morning, beautiful day. In the winter time, it's 75 degrees, it's very comfortable. It's a, a nice morning to begin birding. White-backed vultures, their main main vulture, they have a couple others, but uh, you'll see the white back most common there, the carrion eaters. Uh, they'll clean up everything. We did see a dead giraffe that was just laying there, and nothing would touch it. And our outfitter thought maybe it was bitten by a snake, and it was poisonous, and everything, everybody somehow knew not to eat it. So it was not eaten by the jackals or you know, the hyenas, it was still there for several days. <coughs> this is a blue herb starling. They have nice little dots. I think Jan, this is one of your pictures, I think. I think it is. It's probably my best. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, there's quite a number of starlings. Uh, this is the Glo Cape Glossy Starling. Uh, nice looking birds. We get a chance to see them. And often, and this is the red-winged starling. Uh, it's like our red-winged blackbird, only about twice the size, and it has a long red uh, feather that comes out of the outer, outer wing. And so, uh, these frequently are found around the places where we're serving food. They'll come right in and try to get something underneath your table, uh, like our starlings do sometimes. This is the African morning dove. This is the dark phase. Uh, it looks like a ringneck dove, but it's not. This is the African morning dove. It has a red eye with a yellow insert and a real black pupil in the middle. Uh, very common. You see them all around the area. The Egyptian goose, a migratory bird. Uh, see them all over Africa. And they do fly, and you'll see lots of them. These are yellow-billed hornbills. The one on the right is the male. He's offering a little piece of fruit to the female in a courtship arrangement. He says, hi, honey, this is candy. <laughs> Come on over. We want to meet. Uh, quite, quite frequent. I've got some close-ups, but I thought this one would be one where you'd see two of them. This is the red-billed hornbill. And uh, obviously, it's just got a red bill. Again, very, very strikingly interesting birds. They have quite a number of shrikes. The shrikes are much like our shrike. They catch prey, they stick them on the thorns. Uh, grasshoppers, small lizards, uh, they'll stick them on the thorns for a 
use later on. And uh, uh, they do have, I've only seen three or four so they're, the trikes so far. I didn't get a good picture. This is a scissor bill, or uh, it's got a long scissor tail, and it's just another one of shrikes. I'm trying to get one. Uh, the Jan, your favorite picture? My second best. Second best. <laughs> Crimson breasted shrike. Uh, just an unbelievably beautiful bird. And that crimson breast just pops up. Uh, quite fun to see one of these. <clears throat> the African pied wagtail looks just like the wagtail that we have. The tail is dip, 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 dip. Uh, around water, this one was sitting on a pipe that had some water dripping out of it. Hmm. And so I uh, got a chance to get, at least get a reasonable shot. Lots of weaver birds. They uh, nest pretty much year round, they're building nests. But they do prefer the springtime when they have most of their nests. And uh, the snakes in the area will crawl up the branches, go up and go all the way to the top, reach in, get the egg, swallow the egg, swallow the, the, the chicks. Uh, so snakes are a problem for the weaver birds, but there's so many of them, they have a tree covered with nests. And the nests are grass nests like our uh, Orioles. This is the white-browed sparrow weaver bird. Have to catch them on the ground uh, so you get a good shot. Got a thick beak, seed eaters, and nut eaters, small buried nuts, and, and they can crack those open with a thick beak. These are called blue wax bills. They're green. <laughs> <laughs> They're very pretty. Uh, they do have a bluish waxy bill, and so that's where they got their name from, the blue wax bill. And uh, they, you, you can get right next to them. They'll be standing up here six feet away in the grass. So, uh, fun to see them. Uh, this is their gray heron with, with a crocodile. The crocodile's in the water. If you look up to the right, you can see its eye just above the grass and its snout up there. A very large one. That one's probably about 12, 14 feet long. Good sized crocodile. The birds know where these critters are. They avoid them. Crocodiles would love to have a bird uh, dinner. Greater flamingos with some Egyptian geese. These are migratory and uh, they move from country to country. You'll see them around the ponds and the river systems. Uh, they're like the flamingos we see. Greenback heron. I wish I could bring that one up close. I uh, haven't had a chance to blow it up, so it'll be better. But. Uh, Kind of like our green heron, night heron, that size bird. A uh, very pretty little bird around the water system. The, the black crake, that's right. Uh, find these along the water system. Uh, bright yellow bill, red legs. Uh, fairly easy to identify when you're out looking for birds. This is the baobab tree. The baobab tree is one of the oldest trees in South Africa. This one's about 2,000 years old. It has a fruit about the size of an oblong grapefruit. And inside the fruit is a whole bunch of little seeds. Well, actually, they're good sized seeds. And they're coated with a white chalky substance. When you suck on them, it's very high in vitamin C. So natives then will take one of these, they break them open, they'll suck on them, they get their vitamin C, and then they'll pitch them. Fortunately, in Kruger, they are, some of these old, old trees, they have some survivors, but they're now getting a young crop of younger baobab trees. Or it might take 500 years or 1,000 years getting size to them. But they're making a comeback, and a fun tree to walk up and try to put your arms way out and can't go around at all. Anybody know what kind of owl that is? It's not. It's a girl on a tree. <laughs> uh, do have owls in South Africa. We didn't get many pictures of them. I did get uh, one. It was not a good one. But I thought, well, we'll throw this one in and see what you <laughs> <laughs> 
eagles. The brown snake eagle, uh, they have a variety of eagles. This one, of course, feeds on snakes. And they've learned to grab the snake, take them way up in the sky, and drop them. And they drop them on the road, and it kills them. And then they'll go down and they'll swallow them. They eat, they eat snakes. Uh, this is a little one. I had a heck of a time figuring out what this one was. Uh, all the bird books, couldn't find it. Finally, I found it. Green wing, Patelia, the female. I had a tough time figuring out that was a female. A uh, little ground bird, very pretty. Uh, you'll see lots of small birds, and a lot of them we have a tough time getting them to sit still long enough to take a picture. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were fortunate we did capture a few of them. This is their white-breasted cormorant, same size bird as our cormorant, except they have a brilliant white breast. And uh, quite common around, and this is the young. We saw them in the nest. Woolly neck storks. Uh, they get to, obviously get their name from their woolly neck. Uh, they eat anything that moves. <laughs> if they can catch a small bird, they'll eat it. If they can catch a small turtle, they'll eat it. If they can catch a frog, they'll eat it. A lizard, they'll eat it. Uh, they they are like, like many storks. Uh, they eat a lot. This is the saddleback stork. Again, uh, same type of bird, big bill, and they are looking for small creatures. They'll eat crustaceans, they'll eat fish, they'll eat frogs, they'll eat snakes, whatever happens to come along, uh, they'll try to eat them. This is the African fish eagle. Much like our American eagle, except it doesn't have any white on the tail. And of course, it's more aligned to our our uh, eagles when they're fishing on the river uh, and the ospreys, but they predominantly eat, they do eat fish. They have a couple of different kinds of kingfishers. This one is a more of an inland kingfisher. They they eat a lot of big grass. They have grasshoppers that are four four inches long, very big ones. They'll eat bugs. They'll eat small lizards. It'll catch. Uh, any kind of, of creature they can catch. It lives more in the forest area. And then the malachite, the half-collared kingfisher, this brilliant blue kingfisher along the water system. They're just gorgeous birds. Streaky-breasted seed eaters. That's as close as I could get. They're in flocks of by the thousands. And they fly up in a big flock and they're down in the grass. They fly up in a big flock down in the grass. So they, all I could get was a blur of birds. Uh, many times, 500,000, 2,000 birds flying across the grasslands. And we see, we see quite a number of them. This, <laughs> the gray go away bird. They actually literally sit there and they go, go away, go away, go away. <laughs> That's where they got their name. Uh, Crow-sized bird, soft gray, very pretty, pretty bird. This is a bobo, an immature, uh, a red eye. That was the tip off, the red eye and the sides. And then another bobo, the black cap. Uh, again, it's kind of hard to see that black cap, but uh, good size. Uh, Comparable to our blue jay, that size, maybe a little bit bigger. And this is their robin, uh, white browed robin chat. Exact same size of our robin, white eye streak, you know, beautiful breast, uh, red red breast, and they move just like our robins. So uh, we saw a lot of them. My favorite bird of all is the violet breasted roller. They're strikingly beautiful. Uh, they're noisy. And uh, they sit at the treetops and uh, along the roadside, you can't miss them. Uh, they're very, very strikingly beautiful birds. And, uh, you can get pictures like this anytime you go there. You can get that close easily to find them. The black hooded oriole, much like our orioles, except it's got a totally black head. Mm 
Preston Barbette, seed eater, big thick bill, and uh, a little bit smaller than a robin. It's a male, he has a big black chest patch. Female doesn't have as much of that chest patch. The male has a little more yellow than the red eyebrow. This one I was lucky, this is an African popo. I was walking down a path inside one of the compounds, and I was just walking along not paying attention, and I took a step, and as I took a step, I looked over here, and right beside me was this bird, sitting six feet away. So I quick reach and get my small camera, take a picture, I have no clue what that is. Uh, just sat there, didn't move, perfectly still. I took several pictures, walked around a little bit, didn't move. I walked off, didn't move. Got about 15 feet away, gone. <laughs> uh, holding his position in place. Glossy ibis, very common. See lots of them. Uh, they're probers, long beak probing for insects, worms, uh, probing uh, in the grass area. Uh, secretary bird. Secretary birds are not very common, in fact, they're endangered at this point. Uh, they have long, scaly legs, and they stomp on snakes. They literally stomp on snakes, lizards, keep stomping on, stomp on them. Doesn't matter if the snake is poisonous, because they have these hard, scaly legs. And so even if they get a bite, uh, not going to penetrate that, they keep stomping on them, eventually kill them, they swallow them whole. <laughs> Dragon, they're fairly tall birds. They're good, good sized tall bird. Do you know how it got its name? I do not. I, 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 that's a good question. I need to look that up. I know. The female ostrich is brown for the most part. They hide. They have great big eggs, of course, and they sit on the nest. Uh, and the male is much darker. Uh, it's got more black feathers to it than the ones we saw. The red crested Koran, a grassland bird about the size of our pheasants. And uh, again, these are endangered birds because they supposedly taste very good. <laughs> and they uh, hunt them. They're off of the Otto Kruger. Uh, so to see one of them there was quite a treat. And uh, get a chance to see one close enough in the grass, I could actually get a reasonably good picture. It was pretty good. Well, this is Swainson and spur fowl. It's like about the size of our grouse. Uh, very common. Uh, you see them in flocks. You'll see them run along through the paths, through the woodland. <coughs> They're not shy birds, but they run very fast. They will fly, but they run pretty quickly. Well, we're going to wrap this up. It's nighttime. We started off at dawn. And now it's nighttime, the sun's beginning to go down, <coughs> and it's beginning to set. And of course, being in South Africa, you get those brilliant sunsets, uh, lots of reds. And of course, then that brings us to the end of tonight. <laughs> okay, we have the lights on, I'll answer a few questions. I have two South African bird books I bought in South Africa. I'd have to look at the authors. Uh, they have common names in Afrikaans, and then they have the, the official names, and then they have the names of common English names to them. And so one's about that thick, and the other's a pocket guy. Uh, we can pick them up and they're pretty, pretty nice to have. You can always borrow mine if you go there. Yeah. Two questions. Are all these birds considered native or some of them been kind of kind of like, for example, the ostrich? About 560 are native birds out of the thousand total that they have in the country. Yeah, the rest of them are migratory. They don't have too many imported birds. Uh, they don't have the English sparrows there that we have. So they, I suspect they probably 
do have one or two mostly in the city area where people bring them in and let them go. Uh, but most of them are pretty much uh, the ones we see in the wintertime, those are normal winter <coughs> permanent residents. Like the ostriches, are they genetically related to the ones in Australia? Or? Seem to be, they seem to be identical. I don't know if they're genetically related, but I suspect they are. And if you look at the African continent, and you look at the other places where we find ostriches, they kind of fit together over many years. And so, uh, they look identical. That's all I can tell you. Any other questions? Yes? Um, did you know that there's 90 kinds of animals? How many? 90. 90? Wow. I didn't know that. 90 kinds of animals. That, that's amazing. <coughs> Do their uh, Orioles build a suspended nest? Yes, like just like our Orioles. Mm -hmm. Same type of woven nest. Are they afraid of the snakes as well? Snakes uh, climb trees. Whenever they can climb a tree and they can get close to a bird nest of any kind, and it's got eggs or it's got small birds in it, or if they can catch the birds coming back to defend the nest, they'll catch them. They'll eat them. I didn't notice anything in your slideshow uh, that was something we find in Wisconsin. Are there some? Uh, I haven't seen any. That, uh, our birds are pretty much separate. As far as, I have not seen any birds that we would say. Not even you know, some, or No. Uh, even the ducks are different. I haven't seen the ducks that I saw anyway. It didn't look like our mallards. And that would be probably the most common one that would kind of get further and further away. Yeah. Do, do they have any uh, large diseases like CWD there? They, as far as I know, they do not. Uh, you know, diseases are, there are diseases in every population of animals. And sometimes the diseases hit a population and they almost wipe it out. Uh, that happens quite frequently in different populations around the world. So they're not immune to diseases. Uh, but as far as I know, they don't have CWD. Okay, yes, yeah. uh, This being a closed ecosystem, are there efforts to take some of the animals from this park to a different park to get some gene flow between different areas, or is it pretty much a closed gene pool? Pretty much species? a closed gene pool. Uh, big game ranches all the way around four, or 500,000 acres, fenced in electric fences. Uh, the elephants in Kruger do not respect electric fences. Uh, the older elephants, the females, have learned to put a young dumb one in front of them. <laughs> when they get close to the fence, they nudge them into the fence. And then the fence falls over, and then the whole elephant herd just goes on their way. <laughs> uh, so they do get some of this, the elephants, uh, constant repair of fences all over South Africa. The elephants go where an elephant wants to go. And, uh, they do. Well, I'd like to do a couple things. Uh, we uh, are offering these trips in the summertime. I have an all-women's trip, uh, August <laughs> or April 24th. April 24th to May 5th this year. I have two spots left. So uh, any, any women are interested in going with the group, we're going to take an all-women's group of eight women to Kruger April 24. Just see me afterward. A couple more trips going in August. The information's on the back. Uh, if you want information on that, just send me an email. I'll send you to our itinerary and let you know more about it. Uh, be happy to fill you in on those kind of things, but tonight's not the time to do that. So, uh, but there is information in the back if you want it. Any other questions? Well, thank you for your attention, and we'll call it a